Greetings from the International Labour Organization and its Cooperative Unit, which is uh, commemorating its centenary this year, 2020. On this occasion, we have uh, initiated a series of interviews with uh, cooperative leaders and partners uh, from around the world, as well as ILO constituents. And today, uh, we are very happy to host uh, Dr. Sonia Novkovic. She is the chair of the International Cooperative Alliance Committee on Cooperative Research and a professor at St. Mary's University in Canada. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, how did you get started uh, working on cooperatives? Uh, how, what brought you to cooperatives? Right. Well, it's my, uh, uh, well, where I grew up, really, uh, it was uh, a self-managed system in the former Yugoslavia. So self-management, uh, you know, industrial democracy or economic democracy was the norm. Uh, majority of uh, the, the companies were labor managed. And so this is, you know, I have a, an economics degree that's assuming self-management. So that, that, as I said, was the norm. Uh, I have also worked in self-managed companies uh, as a student um, and then, you know, summer jobs. Uh, but also uh, when I graduated from economics, um, I, did, uh, I, I did start working in one of those companies. Uh, my parents' generation uh, was very, very much involved in building self-management in the country. So this was something that was talked about around the table. It was the normal kind of thing. Um, but... Uh, Self-management in the former Yugoslavia was obviously not exactly the same as the cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So my introduction to the world of cooperation and the International Cooperative Alliance uh, version of co cooperatives was really uh, in the early 2000s when I was already working. Um, so I studied in Canada. Uh, I, was, I, I have my degree from a Canadian university and then I got a job in Halifax and uh, to our university came a proposal to actually have a master's degree in cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, from, from the beginning, uh, because I was coming from labor ownership and labor, and as I said, democracy, um, that, that was a natural fit. And then I started to learn about the much broader context uh, and, and much broader world of cooperation, right? So I went beyond the economics understanding of ownership that matters, but really to, to understanding that it's really membership and, uh, and the use of, of a cooperative enterprises in a variety of ways, not just through labor. But labor still is, is close to my heart, obviously. How does the, the theory and practice of self-management, worker, employee ownership, translate to the world of work today, this changing world of work today? Is it in the uh, growth of worker cooperatives, like in the platform economy and uh, informal economy? How, how has that, uh, how, is, how are those principles, values, or concepts and practices uh, manifesting today? Yeah, so the, the ICA uh, statement on the cooperative identity, which is what we're talking about, um, is absolutely describing cooperatives as, as you know, economic, cultural, and social uh, entities with principles and values. And it's absolutely, uh, there's a revival of cooperation and cooperatives and an understanding of cooperatives as uh, those social and solidarity economy uh, mm. contributors to social solidarity co economy. Uh, because uh, this generation uh, has lived through the crisis, economic crisis, and is, it seems more perceiving the, 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 the uh, variety of crises we are facing through the um, misplaced values. And so this alignment with values is back. Uh, and of course, you know, human dignity at work, uh, the choice of the working conditions, the control over your own working life, all of those things are absolutely critical. Uh, today, I would say more than even you know, a few years ago. Um, so I think this is the occupied generation that is absolutely uh, seeing it through in, in many ways. Yeah. And I, with the pandemic, we are seeing a further acceleration of some of these 
issues uh, of you know a new economic model, uh, the alternative forms of ownership. These are becoming more uh, a part of the new, better normal discussions. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yes. And in there's the context, yeah. Please. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm saying there is a change that's much broader than the cooperative movement, obviously, and there's a shift and change even in the uh, investor-owned business uh, with the, the Davos uh, manifesto and statement that stakeholders uh, mm. are, uh, you know, the focus and it's not just the shareholders. Uh, same thing with the roundtable uh, in the United States. So, so there is this, this shift of a mindset into more uh, values-driven businesses and then understanding with SDGs in particular, with sustainable development goals, uh, that we need the transformation of, of thinking about business and its role. You're from Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, Croatia, and you are also working extent, uh, and living in uh, Canada. Uh, you mentioned this uh, connection between cooperatives and the wider social and solidarity economy. Would you care to elaborate on that? What's that connection? Yeah, well, uh, cooperatives have always been a part of democratically uh, governed entities and the social economy. That has been the understanding of this third sector or, you know, however you framed it, cooperatives were a part of uh, democratically, uh, the democratic, well, economic democracy. Uh, and so they always belong to the social economy together with uh, mutuals and, uh, and uh, associations, right? And in some cases also uh, uh, tr trusts or other, uh, sorry, foundations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so it was always a part of the social economy. But as I said, uh, you know, in, in this era of understanding that nobody can do it alone, uh, mm -hmm. partnerships have to be struck and like-minded mm -hmm. partnerships in particular. So there's much more collaboration and uh, absolutely an understanding that we're in this together and that we need to support each other. So values seem to be the driving force of all of those partnerships uh, of like-minded uh, people really involved in democratic enterprise and, and mm. uh, the supporting structures. Not all of them mm. are democratic in the solidarity economy context, mm. but they're, they're absolutely like-minded in, in building a new economy and thinking about the economy differently. Mm. Um, so absolutely, cooperatives have a center, you know, central place uh, in that mm. in that picture. In your own work, you have written a great deal on worker cooperatives, multi-stakeholder cooperatives. What are multi-stakeholder cooperatives, and uh, how is their emergence uh, something that uh, researchers, policymakers, uh, uh, practitioners? Uh, should pay attention to? Why should they pay attention to the multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. corporate model? Well, uh, precisely for the reasons of, of this uh, idea of people enterprises, right? People-centered mm -hmm. enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, and, and human dignity at the core of human rights, obviously, but mm -hmm. also uh, economic rights. And the economic rights are labor, absolutely labor is central in, in humanistic economics, uh, theory mm. and, and, and uh, context, but um, we are going beyond that into, well, what as a consumer, you also have rights, mm. uh, you know, so, so just, mm. just being focused on work does not capture the need to actually be, also be ethical towards consumers mm. and other people in the chain, right? So supply chain, uh, you know, fair distribution of income, mm. what is that? It's not just fair pay to workers who work, that is absolutely critical but it's also about fair price to consumers. It's about fair treatment of suppliers. It's mm. about the environment. I mean, the, the, the global mm. picture is so, so uh, a part of everything we do and we're absolutely aware of it now. Um, mm. So multi-stakeholder format is um, in, in some, it's, it's a form of cooperative that is um, structured of members with a voice, democratic enterprises where people engaged with it and who have a voice are engaged uh, with different hats, if you will, have different roles in the enterprise. So you have consumers, you have supporting members in Quebec, for example, you have uh, workers uh, as members because they're workers, not as consumers, right? So you have consumer seat and membership and a voice, you have worker membership and a voice, you have, as I said, supporting, it could be supplier, it could be even local governments in some cases, municipal government would have a seat and a voice and so on. 
So multi-stakeholder co-ops are really about solving complex problems and hearing multi-stakeholdership. I mean, it, just hearing different voices and having, giving them a say and, and control over uh, the direction of the enterprise. Um, that in economic theory is costly and problematic from the governance standpoint. It's considered to be costly and problematic because each stakeholder is going to pull it in a different direction. So I much prefer the term solidarity cooperatives, which is what Quebec is using. Uh, because that tells you what the purpose of the enterprise is. It doesn't matter mm. how I'm involved with it, it matters what it does. And so the purpose mm. of the enterprise is solidarity built uh, economy. So, so multi-stakeholdership is really uh, absolutely important in the context of, of uh, sustainable development, in local uh, development, community economic development, and so on. In some countries, uh, this is a, a new, relatively new legal form. Mm -hmm. And we know Italy started with it in the mm -hmm. early 90s, I believe it was. Uh, then we have it in France, in Spain, throughout the world, right? In Canada, Quebec was the first province to introduce it. And now we have other provinces who have it as well. But what's interesting is that uh, it's not a new phenomenon. And there are many, many places where, in fact, the law is flexible enough to allow for multi-stakeholdership to be happening even without knowing that they're multi-stakeholder co-ops. So as I was doing my work in, uh, in Croatia, for example, uh, it turns out that here actually all co-ops are multi-stakeholder. It's as you, you know, you can support the cooperative in a variety of ways. And so you have one near me here that is, uh, as I said, municipal government is a member, producer, local producers of you know, olive growers are members, um, and so are uh, the consumers. Uh, they even have investor members, which, mm -hmm. You know, we can debate that, but anyway, <laughs> there is some, there is a multiplicity of engagements. Uh, there are also, of course, other models, you know, that, that are similar, uh, yeah. but in cooperative world, this is uh, relatively new. As a legal. What form. are the sectors, uh, Sonia, that we see um, the uh, multi stakeholder cooperatives? And is it mainly in the social sector? What you mentioned, for instance, the olive growers and consumers and local government, so that's uh, yeah. uh, in agriculture. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really community development, and this was agro-tourism idea, what okay. the banner mentioned. Um, they're in the social sector, absolutely, in Italy. Uh, there are social cooperatives, typically, um, mm. but, uh, you know, they can be all sorts of, uh, there, are, there are small cooperatives that are worker and consumer owned, uh, we know of some conversions of pre previously food cooperatives in the United States, for example, uh, that was previously consumer cooperative that uh, converted into a multi-stakeholder with worker seats and voice as well. So, so there are all hosts of, you know, conditions and, and circumstances, but uh, it is really the recognition that other people engaged with the enterprise are critically important uh, to its survival and, and, and thriving. And so you bring them to the table and give them a voice basically with this model. You've written about uh, this emergence of cooperatives and solid social solidarity economy initiatives in Cuba. Um, what's happening now uh, in Cuba with uh, these initiatives? There was a point when there was a real rapid uh, growth enthusiasm around it government support around it could you give us a sense of uh, where this uh, these efforts initiatives are? yeah i don't know that it grew beyond the first experiment uh, okay. and i may be out of date on what i'm okay. just saying because the last year i haven't been paying close okay. attention we're now embarking on a new project that will engage Cuba, so I'm hoping to, to hear what's going on. Uh, but it was an attempt to, so in Cuba, it was an attempt to actually uh, not privatize, but socialize parts mm -hmm. of the uh, state sector through co cooperative uh, enterprises. And so some parts, especially the services in the state sector, were then given to workers to actually set up as cooperatives. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so in Cuba, and you have old cooperatives in Cuba that are in agriculture, and those also fall under different types. But these new worker cooperatives were a new, a new experiment, and they grew like there was 500 of them introduced mm -hmm. in the short span of a couple of years. Uh, and so, to my knowledge, that's where they paused, because Cuba being the socialist economy, uh, there is this, this broader social role 
that uh, the, the, the government uh, is perceiving that cooperatives need to play. So they're taking it a bit, they slowed it down in order to make sure that there are no um, outcomes that are, that are you know, consequences of mm -hmm. fast privatization and misunderstandings of what the model is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you mentioned this one example from Croatia for, uh, when you were talking about the multi-stakeholder cooperatives. How is the um, ecosystem, the milieu for uh, cooperation, mutualism in uh, former Yugoslav republics, uh, Croatia, uh, uh, Slovenia and uh, others? Yeah. It's a mixed bag. Uh, each is evolving differently. Um, I don't know that the space is conducive to cooperative development. It certainly is to social enterprise. And that is uh, the project of the broader European Union. So as the European Union is providing funds, support, and as uh, you know, former Yugoslav states that have joined the, the European Union fall under those, uh, uh, you know, under the discourse, but also funding and support and so on, that's pretty much where things have shifted in Croatia mm -hmm. and uh, somewhat in Slovenia. Um, there have been some attempts. I mean, there are, of course, old cooperatives. You have some who have survived many regimes in this space and are, you know, 100 plus years old, uh, but there aren't many. Uh, and those that are that old are mostly in agriculture. Um, and so in Serbia, I believe also agricultural sector is surviving, mm -hmm. but other sectors uh, are not doing so great on the co-op model. However, the broader social solidarity economy is taking off uh, you know, mm -hmm. and broadening together with European Union's uh, push mm -hmm. to do that. And there are a number of new laws, the framework laws. Right, the there are framework laws, but social. there's also the, uh, the ecosystem and support structures and networks uh, that actually okay support social enterprise and financing uh, as right. well yeah okay uh, going back to research uh, you are the chair of the international cooperative alliance uh, committee and cooperative research uh, could you tell us about this committee what does it do why why was it established and how does it work mm -hmm. the committee uh, is one of the five thematic committees of the Alliance. And uh, it is um, a committee of um, academics and researchers. So both practitioners and academics, researchers uh, on, on co in, in cooperative studies. So it's really a broad spectrum of research on cooperatives from law, history, to economics and business. Um, so pretty much, uh, you know, a multidisciplinary kind of gathering. Uh, and the committee's role is really to um, amplify you know, uh, to amplify the, the impact of cooperatives and, and the cooperative movement. Um, of course, we find our role also because it is research driven to be one of uh, sounding alarm bells uh, as well and uh, pointing to the things that could be done better, <laughs> right? So there is that critical eye as well. Um, all of the researchers are, or most of the researchers are outsiders, but of course supportive of the, this alternative economy. So we have that kind of a, you know, a, a role to actually support the COP movement, but also, as I said, to, to point uh, to, to the issues that uh, the movement is facing. Uh, it, it's really an interesting, interesting group, and it's uh, our main, uh, my main role is to actually organize conferences uh, that is, is happening regionally, uh, according to the ICA regions. So we have the Asia Pacific, Europe, uh, the Americas, Latin and uh, and North America and Africa. So in those four, uh, you have uh, gatherings of researchers, in some cases annually, some cases biannually, and then we have global conferences as well. Uh, and those global conferences are usually uh, well attended by, by both the, the, you know, the movement, the practice, right, and the leadership in the uh, ICA, uh, as well as uh, academics and researchers uh, from other walks of life, if you will. How are you managing in the time of COVID with the research conferences? Well, like everybody else, do we go online? Do we go live? <laughs> you know, when do we pull the plug? Do we... So it's just like mm. everybody else. All the mm. conferences are facing the same thing. Um, our conferences had to be canceled this year, of course. Mm. Um, the global one will be with the 125-year uh, celebration of the uh, International Cooperative Alliance, which is this year. 
but it's not going to happen in Seoul, Korea. It is moved into 21. Um, and so we will have a, a big research conference with that event. So we're just moving it as the Congress is moving, but regional conferences have to be um, creative. And so European is going to have a set of online events. Uh, I see that you guys are doing webinars, which is also fantastic, right? So, so those sorts of uh, Mm. reminders that that we're active and we're doing what we can are, are absolutely mm. critical so yeah mm. so we're going online in some cases and in others we're just not able to do it this year in the realm of research there is always the issues around data and uh, verification being able to generalize uh, compare uh, data across uh, countries sectors and you done a great deal of work around measurement and indicator issues. Uh, you were also a member of the working group on statistics of cooperatives uh, uh, for, uh, with uh, COPAC, the Committee for the Promotion and Advancement of Cooperatives. Could you share some thoughts on the measurement issues as it relates to cooperatives and wider social and solidarity economy? Where do we stand on that? Yeah, as you well know, uh, the ILO has been supporting that work in, in very, very important ways. And so there is this um, sense that we will have some, some uh, collective understanding of how to even count cooperatives, let alone others, like, you know, without even going into other kinds of entities, uh, but cooperatives themselves are not well understood. And uh, uh, this, this uh, push to actually solidify statistics on cooperatives is critically important. Uh, and so even, even categorizing cooperatives in a consistent way has been a challenge because they're both economic and social entities. So some, some countries categorize them according to the social role that they play. Women's co-ops, youth co-ops are, are obvious examples. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so we really need to solidify what, what kinds of cooperatives are out there. And there is amazing work done actually by this uh, group that was uh, supported through COPAC and the ILO um, uh, on, in the statistics conferences has pushed the agenda forward uh, to actually have a simple way to consolidate that information mm -hmm. and to gather the data. So we, in a nutshell, do not have appropriate data on cooperatives. There is a very, very important work done by the World Cooperative Monitor, uh, which started in the mid 2000s. Um, and World Cooperative Monitor is, I think, um, the piece of, of uh, um, research that is produced by Eurixe in Italy, uh, the European uh, Research Institute, who finally provided some kind of data to researchers to actually go from. But that is very limited because it's only the largest 300. Uh, then it expanded a little bit, but it, it's still quite limited and it's drawing from a, a diversity of, of, of resources or sources, I should say. Anyway, so long story short, uh, the work on statistics is critically important. It's ongoing, it's moving forward, right? But we do not still have a consistent way to actually uh, count cooperatives, let alone try and, and assess the real impact that they have. And uh, then in the broader, of course, social economy, uh, the same problem is there. So, you know, who are the entities? Uh, informal economy is in bigger than the formal economy in many countries. So how do you even count that? And we couldn't even start uh, to do that work in, in our group with COPAC, but uh, I know that other work is done uh, in other UN agencies. So it's a complicated world, uh, but nevertheless, it's very important to, um, to understand how cooperatives mm -hmm. contribute. But we're doing some work with SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and it's not enough to just say, oh yes, cooperatives, you know, contribute to e income equality or they alleviate poverty, uh, it's important to understand why they do it and how they do it uh, in order to actually mm -hmm. see what the real impact is on the people who are involved. So mm -hmm. that's difficult. It's not, there's no easy answer. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to, to, to do the work that we can to actually uh, have a, the right picture about them. The guidelines on statistics of cooperatives that were adopted at the 2018 um, International Conference of Labor Statisticians, how do you think a cooperative researchers can use them to towards better harmonization of the data uh, sources and uh, 
collection methods, um, etc. What uh, what do you think uh, is the role for cooperative researchers in uh, operationalizing, activating the, the these guidelines, bringing mm -hmm. them to life? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a back down to resources and it, without the, adop the adoption of the guidelines by all the stakeholders, right? So statistical offices, they have to collect the data in a way that then researchers can access them. Uh, each, uh, you know, the difficulty with research that's data driven is, or, uh, is that you have to collect that data. So that makes it very, very costly uh, unless data sets already exist. Uh, and of course, then most work is done with the data sets that already exist. Uh, and so it's, it's really a challenge. If you have to start from scratch and collect your own data, the guidelines absolutely are helpful. Uh, you know, and I think even categorization of properties, it's critically important that we match the two. Uh, you know, so when we gather the data that we look at, uh, at the guidelines. But uh, as I said, without statistical offices collecting the data, without uh, all the uh, institutions and agencies being aware of them, it's going to be very mm. difficult to move it forward. So yeah, we have mm. researchers have a role to mm. play, but it's also mm. uh, you know other mm. players who need to be at the table. Yeah, national statistic offices, right. the registrars, the administrative data collectors. Uh, exactly from the co-op movement side as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have worked with the ILO and other UN agencies. Uh, in your time as a researcher with the ICA, the committee, um, what do you think is the role these agencies, uh, UN agencies in general have to play, but also more specifically ILO uh, has to play um, in relation yeah, it, to cooperative? Yeah, I, it's, I think it's, it's really essential. Uh, to me, this is you know, a partnership that, that is absolutely fruitful um, the United Nations recognizing cooperatives, uh, the 2012 as the International Year of Cooperation was really the launching pad uh, for the blueprint of, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the blueprint from the ICA and other documents that came after that, uh, the blueprint for the cooperative decade. Uh, the next strategic 10 years of strategy plan, a strategic plan from the ICA is coming based on that work. So, you know, the, what ILO is doing and especially the cooperatives unit is absolutely giving visibility to cooperatives and also placing them within the broader social economy, which I think is quite important, social solidarity economy. So, so all of these players are absolutely critical in the advocacy work, uh, but also, as you pointed out already, you know, we're all sitting at different tables at different times, uh, and it's, it's absolutely necessary to, to have that support in order to move the agenda on statistics, on mm. awareness, on building the movement, on partnering with others, uh, all of those elements to actually change the economy, you know, and have more humanistic uh, uh, economy. So to me, the, the importance is in actually understanding that that's what we're supposed to do <laughs> and then and transform the system and then working together actually towards that goal. Are you hopeful with regard to uh, cooperatives being recognized as um, a critical part of this diverse uh, landscape of uh, enterprises that we need in uh, building back better from this crisis and uh, mm -hmm. for uh, sustainable development, uh, for resilience in local communities. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you feel hopeful about that or what's your view? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, am I hopeful? I guess I wouldn't be in this business if I wasn't, mm. <laughs> right? So, yep, I'm hopeful. Is it moving fast enough? Probably not. Um, but, yeah, but I think what this has shown us is that we're absolutely on the right track of, of thinking the economy has to look different. And whether it's mm. the cooperative or some other model, uh, really, it, at the end of the day, it's not going to matter if we're really changing how the, the, the infrastructure works and what it's there for. And more and more I'm hearing that the value system has to change. Not change, we have it. It's just deploy it in the economic sphere, right, is what we need to do. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm hopeful. I don't know that it's going to be just the cooperative model that is going to dominate. Um, I would love it to be more prevalent, and it is actually in some sectors absolutely it's dominant. But, uh, but it's really those partnerships with everybody else who is, who is thinking alike and doing what they can 
Um, and I, yeah, so I'm very hopeful if we, and if we recognize each other, if we recognize who is having the same agenda and continue to work together, I think a lot can be done much faster than mm -hmm. uh, if folks are trying to do it on their own. Yeah. We in fact started with a collaboration uh, around a joint research conference in 2015 uh, ICA uh, Committee on Cooperative Research and ILO Coop. Uh, we organized the Cooperatives in the World of Work Research Conference, uh, which resulted in a publication uh, from Routledge and Cooperatives right. in the World of Work. So we need to have another one when we can do these research conferences. I was just thinking, you know, this COVID experience is definitely mm -hmm. going to result in a lot of stuff that, that we need to explore and take a look yeah. at and see how yeah. our cooperatives are coping. Uh, and, yeah. And, yeah. 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 And contributing. Yeah. Absolutely. And contribute. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your time, Sonia. Always a pleasure yes. talking with you until we get to meet again. <laughs> yes, in person, right. Online, I'm sure exactly. I'll see you soon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>